Welcome back to the channel. I'm Robin Clevett. You're joining me on a really nice autumnal day. And this is a typical life, typical day in the life of a carpenter. I nearly fell over my words again, but that's not unusual. So I'm out here. I'm in a car park with garages and the garage doors here have absolutely had it. They're softwood, they've been painted, but they don't have a long lifespan. So we're gonna change them. So what we're up against here is we have no power. And since the advent of 18 volt cordless tools, we've been able to do stuff much quicker, much easier than we've ever been able to do them before. But we've got to keep the place clean. We have got to keep the place tidy. So we've got a brand new battery dust extraction unit it goes with all your power tools and we're going to feature that in this video. It's a really nice product. It's from Metabo. Metabo is a brand who I've been working with closely for many years. Great products, but this new vacuum cleaner is a bit of a game changer. So we're going to get on, get the old doors out. We're going to take these two legs out. We're going to replace those as well. And we're going to swing the new doors. Now what we're up against here is the garages are nice and plumb here but the head is a little bit out where everything's been moving. So we've got to do a little bit of shooting in. So we'll probably use a rail saw for that and an electric planer, depends how much we have to take off and then we'll get them fitted. Now, this is for a really good mate of mine, Les, who I've known for many, many, many years and he's painted the doors already, which is great. He's used a saddling super deck, which is a fantastic out of the can straight onto the timber product so that's the paint that you'll see on these doors so i'm going to get on with it now and get this job done before the rain comes i always find it amazing how water can do this to joinery and i think when you've got a tongue and groove panels like this the problems exacerbated. There's lots of fixings, the hinge fixings, the water collects. And if you don't maintain this sort of stuff, the water's just gonna get in and it's just gonna completely blow it as you can see. And it doesn't take long, it only takes a couple of years, a couple of seasons, wet seasons, and it just goes. So let's get them done. Now this is a tip for you, anyone who's sent out to replace a window or a door and you've got the new joinery and you've got the existing opening, before you do anything, before you start stripping it out, measure the new ones, measure the old ones and make sure the new stuff is correct because we're only human and even the guys that make stuff can make an error. It's as simple as that. So just make sure you've checked your new joinery and it's gonna fit, or you've got a boarding up job to do, you've got to go away, and you've got to come back when the new stuff's made, and it's gonna cost you twice as much, or the client. We've removed the doors. We've taken out these rotten frames. We're going to replace those rotten flame. We're going to replace those rotten flame. We're going to replace those rotten frames, not flames. I don't know where I got that from. Anyhow, so they were four by three prepared. And what I'm going to use now is a four by three pressure treated. It's going to last a bit longer. It's virtually the same material. That was redwood that we took out, which is this effectively, what you see my trestles made out of. This is a very similar type. It's more like a white wood. Obviously it's treated and it can be painted, but it's going to stand the test of time. So I'm going to cut these back in and I can't remove the old mortise. There's all kinds of nails and fixings through them. So I'm going to come straight up with a butt joint, but on the back, I'm going to cleat them to the back of the frame so they're connected and they make a nice strong job. I'm also going to be using on the bottom some of my tape. Let me see where I put that here. So I'm also going to use some of my tape and I'm actually going to have a really nice cut on the end and I'm going to tape the end grain 
this adhesive is fantastic on this tape and that will also stop water penetrating and that will just give it a bit more of a life as well and I think it's also key if you keep it just off the concrete we could use a plastic shim underneath it and that would just also mean that any water that's collecting on the ground at this point here is going to, in our case, it's going to run away anyway, but at least it's not going to get sucked up into the bottom of the jam. And the, and the shim will take the load, obviously. And I just think that's a sensible way to do it. Because if you do bang it against the ground, it starts rotting. It's going to want to tend to the weight of the doors. It's going to want to push it down. They're all going to go out of shape. Now, I've checked my reveals for plum and they're pretty good. As I mentioned a bit ago, they're pretty plum. So with regards to the doors, they should be fairly parallel, but the head, when I check the head, it's falling away, which is a bit of a shame. I will have a look here to see if this plate could be wedged up against this. I'll have a look at that first because it's obviously all over the gaff. If I can move it up, I'll put a wedge in first to just see if I can get it up. So I'm gonna get the jams in, all the frames. I'm going to cut them in tight first. 1990 for that one. That's 1992. So I'll cut two at the same length. We'll get them in, we'll get them fitted, and then we'll mark what we're going to take off to let a shim go underneath so they're not in contact with the ground. So first of all, we need a nice square end on the end of each one. I've not got a chop saw here, so we're back to a good old fashioned handsaw. Nothing wrong with that. These are lovely and straight we'll take off. In fact, that is a really nice machined end. We'll keep that one. We'll turn this one around and use the same as that because I am going to trim it. It's a nice square end too. Okay, so let's cut the length off the other end. I can hear a pass load going in the background. Lots of work going on all over the place. It's an unmistakable sound. Measure twice, check twice, cut once. Or it's, if you don't check it, you have to do two trips to the timber merchant. There we go. Great. Thanks for all the comments recently as well on the channel. Some of the videos, um, I just think my group of followers, subscribers, you're all amazing. Some really intelligent people. I'm learning a lot from you guys as well. Let's share knowledge. It's important. Pop that out of the way. We'll just pinch that in over here. Pinch that in here somewhere. Ready. Jack that up in a minute. Let's do this one. When I'm using a handsaw, if you're new to this, I know a lot of you guys are keen DIYers. Let's use the whole of the handsaw. Yes, it's a disposable handsaw. For the price they are, it's easier to buy one of these than actually set and sharpen a saw. I know it's a terrible thing to say as a carpenter, but I've got to be commercially minded, I've got to make money, and I've got to make sure my customers don't pay too much money for my time. Use the full length, that's what it's for. But when these saws get a bit dull, we give them to the bricklayers. So we're doing our bit, we're doing our recycling bit. it let's give that a little tap up best not use my hand so 
someone did mention that the other day. They said, don't use your hand. I was banging some cladding. And someone said, don't use your hand. So, cheers. Someone just give me the nod where the hammer was. That's it. Okay, let's just bo bosh that in there. Right, so before I do anything else, I'm going to check between the two. I've got the ideal thing for this. These devices are great. They're so accurate. So it's a laser measuring device. Laser, not sonic. Sonic ones just aren't accurate enough for what we're doing. Let's put me a dot on the other side. I've got 2144 at the top. Check the bottom. I've got 2145 at the bottom. We're a millimetre out, which is absolutely fantastic. There we go. So, it was 2144 at the top, 2145 at the bottom. So we are parallel as far as I'm concerned. Now what we're gonna do is make uh, a quick measurement of the doors that we're putting in. If they're in here, it's a bit dark. Have a little look at this. <coughs> We have got the pair of doors here and I've just put them together here on the rebate. And we've got 21.35. And so we have got exactly 10 millimeters. So that's absolutely fantastic. Three, three and three with a millimeter to spare. So technically speaking, I'm not having to take anything off of either side of these doors to get them to fit. This tape is a really, really nice product. I've <clears throat> been testing this for a while now on decking. You may have seen the videos of it. And also we had a bit on a piece of wood under, literally under water outside and we tried to pull it off and it literally pulls the fibers out of the timber. So it really does give you a good bond. <clears throat> Just like another insurance policy against rot. Right, so now I need to mark my fixings. Now, what I wanna be doing is if you can see the brickwork here, I wanna be coming into the header. Sorry, the stretcher, not the header. I wanna get into the stretcher. I wanna get right in the middle. There'll be a frog somewhere, it may be up, maybe down. But generally speaking, if I'm in the middle, I'm gonna be away from it. I'm gonna be able to back fix the top straight the way through. And I need to start with a counter bore what's a counter bore a counter bore is just a hole bigger than the head of the screw i'm going to use a screw which is direct into the brick no fiber or plastic plug needed i'm going to count to bore halfway on my drill bit there i'll just make a little pencil mark there do it like this got a pencil mark there that's where i want to be so the idea is I'm just going to counter bore that in. Get all those done. One above damp. That's it. So we're gonna get that all screwed to the wall. Before I attach everything, I'm gonna cut my door stop at the top and I'm gonna pinch it in, pop a little fixing in the middle and that will hold my posts exactly where I want them. 
So when I'm drilling here, if it tries to pull in too tight, it's gonna keep the top where I want it. I'm gonna add a millimeter on, so it's a pinch fit. I've measured it with that um, laser measure. I want 2145, I'll add a millimeter on. I'll we'll pinch that across here. That's it. Just to hold it. Let's get these fixed through the top. I'm gonna prepare the doors. As I say, they've had a couple of coats of paint. All joinery, traditionally, comes with what we call a horn. Here's the horn, and it basically protects the joinery for when you're moving it around site and you're standing up. So this isn't uncommon. So when you buy a door, sometimes you'll find they've got the horns on. I need to take the horns off before I try and shoot it in. So this is how I always take my horns off. I use my handsaw, and I just rub it against the head here. Follow that, it keeps it nice and straight. Through the face side. Now, if all things were nice and flat, straight, square and true, then I would clean the horn up like this now. I'd take my little plane and I would just follow that little rounded edge there. Both sides. I'm using the plane at 45 degrees and I'm sort of going inwards. You don't want to go that way because you're just going to break out that grain. And that's how we take off the horns. So we're going to take them all the way off, all the way around. You can actually see here that the boarding isn't that straight. It's all over the shop, in fact. But this is pretty normal for this standard of joinery. So it's a mass produced garage door by one of the big names, Gerald Wen in this case. They're not sponsoring me before anyone says you've got free garage doors. No free garage doors, bought garage doors. <laughs> Someone might also say, why didn't you make them yourself? Because they produce these in such big numbers, I couldn't compete with them on price. Couldn't even buy the material for what they can produce these for. I'd love to make them, but it's not commercially viable. We took the horns off and I've put the first one in against the new frame, in against the stops and I have airbagged it and I've actually shimmed it to where I want it, allowing for my two or three mil gap at the top. Now we're gonna place this one in situ, airbag it and we're gonna get all the top right and then we're gonna ping a line through the bottom, which is what we need to take off in this case. I don't wanna to take too much off the head because the strap hinges need a good fixing and there's only about 90 millimeters of head if you include the rebate which is hidden behind these tongue and groove boards. We'll spin it, come around there and we keep the rebate tight-ish. Let's pop the airbags under if I just hold it here. I'll just pop this in. Right, I'm gonna just lift it a slight bit and we'll just pack. So the airbags obviously help me by allowing me to lift it 
great innovation. It's probably one of the best things since that cliche sliced bread. All right, so what we need to do is we're going to pull a line through the bottom from the underside of my 10 millimeter relieved frames all the way through and then we're going to cut that off so i want you to go on the bottom of the frame okay yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now we've got a line through the bottom. Now that's what we want to trim off. Just to even it all up, because we're sitting in that bit in the middle here, where that concrete's all lumpy and bumpy. And that'll be nice and true then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, we're going to take this off with the rail saw. Make a nice job of this. So. When I started this video, I mentioned the fact that I've got no power and I'll be using all my battery tools. And since battery tools have come along, we can do so much more wherever we are. So this is a really good 18 volt. It's actually 36 volt. It takes two 10 amp power batteries in the back, 18 volts. So they both couple in the back. Let me just show you that. There we go. And then, there's no cable, so normally you'd plug your extractor in and you'd plug your saw into the extractor. But what the guys in Matabo have got is a really innovative, it's like a vibration sensor on the hose. It's like a wristwatch and it also serves as, if I put it on auto, a button. Which is ingenious, but more ingenious is when you attach it to a saw and you can attach this, you can take this off this and put it onto a chop saw, for example, electric planer, and it works. So I've got the rail positioned on my line. I've already done the sacrificial edge, which is the first cut, if you like, and I've got it clamped on with a quick release clamp underneath. And I'm gonna set the depth. So we want to be, we've got a 44 millimeter rail and we've got about a 15 millimeter board. So to be fair, we can just go all the way through. I've got it set on zero. I'm not gonna be putting a backing bevel of any sort on this. I'm just gonna be blasting straight through. So let's get this one cut. Look at that, it's amazing how that's held itself together. I think that's all by paint, but look at that section through. The TNG, you've just got a rebate there, so that must be mechanically fixed. Then you've got these nice little tongue and grooves. You can see how much tolerance is allowed in that tongue and groove there. It's all about expansion and contraction. And you can see there, they, they all vary, but look at that. Who would have thought that would have stayed together? If you wanted it to, it would have never have done it. So. I want to keep that now. It's like a little sort of a headband, you know? It's like a green tongue and groove headband. There you go. The green suits me, it matches my eyes. <laughs> right, that's that done. Let's do the next one. No more messing around.
all of our doors are trimmed. We've got what we call the slave door, which is the one that the lead door closes over. This is the one that gets bolted back in position and held with the correct amount of space around it. I'm using a galvanized strap hinge. Now the trouble with these are, look at how floppy that is in there. So when you're fixing these, you can screw them on the face, but as soon as you let them off, they want to pull the door. So what I like to do is offer them in situ, fix the strap across the face of the door, one, two, three. And then when I screw this one up, I'm going to use the screws to pull it over. So when the weight goes on, it doesn't sink. Using a centering bit, it's ideal for this. Let's get one in. Okay. Now we just want to make sure they're nice and parallel to everything. Which is pretty tricky because this has got a real wavy edge on it. I'm going to fix that up. Cheers, bro. I'm using a screw with a torx head, a little bit more unlikely for someone to walk along and unscrew that. Now, when I screw this in, I'm going to bias the screws to the side to pull that pin against the side of this hinge. So we're going to do that first. Okay, I want um, two longs and two shorts for this okay. one. I've got to change the bit. Thank you, no my faithful assistant. Thank you. <laughs> and then bias that over there as well. And what that's doing is pulling that pin tight to that side. So I'm not going to fix any more in for now. So I've got two more screws for adjustment. And then we're going to get the bottom strap on. Now, the bottom one needs to be fixed in relation to the bottom rail, which is behind, behind the door. So I need to take a measurement for that. And it's around about 95 to the center. Now I'm going to get my small level And I'm going to level a little line through for the screws. 95, let's use this little marker here. You can see it a bit clearer now. Now, <clears throat> so the theory is good about marking a level line, but it's hard to see. But you look down there, it's all over the place. You know, this metalwork isn't, isn't that true. Even the screw holes don't line up. So it's all about the eye quite a lot of the time. You know that if you've been in the trade a long time. So now this is a shim which is holding everything where i want it i'm just going to mark a little line through here just so i can get the first one where i want it and we'll get the first one in then i'm going to stand back and have a look at that and make sure it's nice and true give it a little bit of a tweak now this one because the hinge is going to push against it i'm going to bias the screws that way so i want to make sure that they're nice and tight that way we'll get them wound in again leave in two for adjustment should i need it Now that's the basis of the strap hinge, really straightforward and easy. And as I say, you do all these in situ. Then we've got a coach bolt. I'll just show you that. It's just a typical coach bolt. We've cut these down. That gets bored through. Let's bore that through the top there.
go through until I can see it on the other side, then drill back. You don't want to smash it out. We can pop our bolt through there. So we have got all the packers out and we've got the hinges in situ now. And so we won't do any more yet. We won't put the last screws in either hinge until I've got the other door on to make sure that the tolerances are right. Because if, for example, it drops on these straps, which I said before, they're not that fantastically engineered, then we've got the adjustment of the new holes and we can put longer screws in the others. So, that's all perfect. We'll just hold that too while we do this door. Put a little packer underneath of it. In fact, let's put something a bit more substantial under there. Let's pop a bag under it for now. That will hold it. Now we can put the other door into position. And then we want some shims to lift it up. How are we looking? That's it, right. So that's held in position. Now we're gonna give it the correct amount of space. Just pull that back there. Get my space between the hanging side. The doors are hung, they're swinging. We've put the old bolts back on. We like saving the planet. Now, I'm just putting a lock on. Let's just bolt this one up. There. Now, I've been using these gate mates. They're absolutely fantastic. I've, I just think the innovation is, fa is brilliant. They're so simple to fix, and I've never seen this from a lock manufacturer before. They give you a self-adhesive template. It speaks for itself. There's one hole for the cylinder that goes all the way through, 28 millimeter hole, and it's just a matter of piloting for the fixings holes. So you can see that they say fixing hole position is the smaller one, cylinder hole position. Now, don't be drilling here and here, because that's just to give you an idea that that's where you're meant to drill. So I think I'll start by putting a little pilot in here. We're gonna go all the way through with that so we can drill from both sides. Good practice. A little bit of timber there to drill into. You don't want to smash all the way through. <laughs> then we'll drill these other pilots for the fixings. Three and a half millimeter drill. It's always a three and a half. We're going in softwood so we don't have to go too deep. Now we're going to peel off this. The jobs are good. Right, let's change the drill bit. We're going to pop in the decent 28. And we're going to go from both sides. <clears throat> Probably the simplest lock you're ever going to fit, but probably the strongest. The fact that the barrel is 90 degrees to this huge, super huge spindle here, and it travels so far behind the, the other door, 
just think it's fantastic and certainly strong. Good practice to always check that you don't over screw something out of square. So I've just got to whack these last two screws in, put the escutcheon on the outside, which is nice and neat. And then the keep and job's good one. Nice. And I'll just get the escutcheon. It's basically a face plate, which we'll put over the outside here. I'm positioning it to miss this line here. Normally I'd want the screw upright like that, but it's a bit close to that rebate. So I'm gonna spin them round and have this one at nine o'clock. Now we just need the teeniest, teeniest, teeniest screwdriver known to man. Oh, this is the real test for my eyesight, this. All it looks like is a little gold pin. I'm feeling my way. I'm using my 35 years of experience to literally oh, just feel my way. But I think that's a nice finish. It's a nice detail. You can get a slightly shorter barrel, but it was just a little bit on the short side, the one that was available. So I've gone for the slightly longer one. It doesn't impair the strength or anything like that. So. And that's it, that's the lock fitted. So it's one hole through the middle, four screws, and we have five keys as well. So thanks for joining me. These garage doors are fitted. I've really enjoyed it today. Another example of 18 volt battery tools just being much better for us chippies. I'm out here, there was no power, no power in the garage, no power available. I came with fully charged batteries. The dust extractor is still on its full power. So I'll be interested to see just how long that lasts. Admittedly, it was just a few cuts, a little bit of planing, and I'm gonna do a little bit of clearing up with it now. And that's it. So thanks very much for joining on the channel. Keep checking back soon, follow me on Instagram and look in the links in the description for more information about this Metabo stuff and I'll see you very soon.